Good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all on behalf of the missions department at uh, CMC Velo for this uh, um, sixth lecture in the CMC Velo public lecture series. Uh, this particular lecture is on infection control in the current phase of the COVID pandemic. So today we have this interesting topic that sort of grabs everyone's attention, uh, how to keep people safe, be it patients or healthcare workers alike, uh, during this current uh, COVID situation. So for this, we have Dr. Priscilla Rupali from the Department of Infectious Disease, um, who is also the head of the Infection uh, Hospital uh, Infection Control Committee to deliver this lecture. And uh, the lecture will be moderated by uh, Dr. Joyce Arojini Michael, uh, who is also the professor and head of uh, um, microbiology, who is also the secretary for the hospital uh, infection control uh, committee. So I request Dr. Joy to introduce Dr. Priscilla and uh, moderate the session for this evening. Over uh, to Dr. Joy. Thank you, Dr. Winsley. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, session on infection control uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Priscilla, as was told by Dr. Winsley, she's Professor of Medicine in Adult Infectious Disease Department. She's the Deputy Chair of Hospital Infection Control Committee. And during this uh, COVID pandemic, she has actually worked very hard in formulating guidelines and protocols uh, to protect ourselves as well as uh, patients uh, from this infection and uh, to control the spread in the community as well as in the hospital. So over to Dr. Priscilla. Thank you. Okay, so good evening, everyone, and uh, uh, welcome to this uh, lecture. And hopefully, we'll be able to give you some insights as to how to deal with this disease, which has kind of overtaken all of our lives. Uh, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Um, um, Okay, is my screen visible to everybody? Yes, Priscilla. Okay, great. So, uh, I must say, uh, though I'm giving the talk, there are plenty of people behind the scenes. And uh, I make this presentation on behalf of the Hospital Infection Control Committee, which has actually worked extremely hard behind the scenes to make this hospital safe uh, for each and every one of us. So, with uh, Joy, Malti, Hema, all the wonderful infection control nurses, uh, the MS, uh, medical superintendent's office and, um, and the GS office. So uh, I'll be sharing a few insights uh, in how, some of it will be how we dealt with it. There are no perfect answers for many of these. There's not too much evidence for a lot of this, uh, but uh, I'm sure we, it's, it's gonna be a time uh, of learning together. So this is going to be the outline of my talk. This is what Anand wanted me to cover uh, and uh, basically basics of transmission, uh, period of infectivity, what are constituted as the high risk transmission procedures, uh, PPE or personal protective equipment and risk, uh, how to prevent transmission in the hospital, contact tracing and what are the situations requiring quarantine, uh, surgery, chemotherapy, transplant screening and uh, clearance for COVID-19 patients. Uh, I'm not really going to dwell too much on evaluating a symptomatic healthcare worker uh, as such, because you've had plenty of uh, sessions on how to actually um, manage a patient uh, with the disease. So really, uh, this will be done in the context of contact tracing, really not rather than as a separate topic and a little bit about uh, reinfections per se. So um, as all of you know, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is a beta coronavirus and the corona really is, uh, is uh, so named because of the crown that is actually, that shows up uh, in an electron micrograph. So this is what it looks like. It does suspiciously look like a crown and the crown being contributed to by the spike proteins. It is a positive single standard RNA and the genome has four to five structural proteins, S, M, N, uh, H, E, and E. Uh, the spike protein mediates uh, receptor binding uh, and fusion with the host cell membrane. 
membrane protein is responsible for the viral assembly, nucleocapsid protein, viral RNA synthesis, and cytotoxic activity, and will up this assembly and release of the virus. So like any other uh, disease which is transmitted, there are basic, the, what we call as the six vital links for transmission. And you need breaking of this particular uh, uh, cycle or a loop to control the spread of infection. So you have a causative agent, you have a reservoir, you have a portal of entry and portal of exit, you have a mode of transmission and you have a host that is susceptible. So when you look at uh, basics of transmission, uh, I think these are the three main things that you need to be concerned about whenever you're dealing with a respiratory virus. So you have airborne, which is really droplet nuclei. How do droplet nuclei actually happen? So you cough or you sneeze, generating a forceful um, uh, stream of droplets. And if the droplets are five micrometers, uh, and above, they basically, um, and you happen to be close to a person and they, um, uh, they're able to actually transmit it directly onto your mucosal surfaces. The other way to do it would be, uh, uh, suppose you happen to touch a contaminated surface, which is basically contaminated with the droplets or containing the infectious virus and the susceptible host touches the contaminated surfaces and gets the infection. The third modality or the most controversial modality with regard to uh, COVID-19 is really uh, droplet nuclei. And this really happens when you have to, uh, you cough or sneeze or something, whatever you generate as droplets containing infectious nuclei, they may evaporate or they may disseminate. Uh, and uh, if they have um, small drops, that is drops which are less than five micrometers, we call them droplet nuclei. And this can be inhaled again uh, by a susceptible host and then can produce infection. So the most important thing to remember is droplets, basically close range contact is what gives rise to infection. So by respiratory droplets through a cough or sneeze. And generally, so WHO and CDC are slightly at variance here. I want to give you both perspectives. WHO uh, says three feet or one meter. CDC would say six feet or two meters. But suffice it to say that generally beyond two meters, it cannot actually happen. This has been studied through various um, uh, uh, simulated models with fluorescence, and uh, that is how this has actually been uh, uh, proven. Long range is through small droplets, uh, and so these droplet nuclei can actually be airborne, and they can remain suspended in the air uh, especially in poorly ventilated enclosed spaces, and then can remain airborne for as long as three hours. And this is uh, one of the methodologies that we believe that happens whenever you generate an aerosol, which may be some aerosol generating procedures, whether it's intubation or nebulization or high flow oxygen mass, et cetera. And we'll come to them in a minute. So there is that we get a lot of these questions uh, and uh, what is actually the transmission rate? What happens when you're trans, uh, flying uh, in a plane? Uh, what happens when you're traveling in a bus? What happens in your enclosed room? Uh, so what really is the data that is showing? So data, as you can imagine, is extremely controversial. Uh, there are different, different rates that are actually being reported. So I'm really, uh, I'm presenting right now what is a perspective of implant transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is basically uh, talking about how face masks can uh, be efficacious in reducing uh, the attack rates of SARS-CoV-2 while traveling on a, a flight. And what are the um, things that they actually noted when uh, masking was optional and when masking was mandatory. Uh, this uh, article has actually been um, written by Dr. David Friedman, who is one of the foremost authorities in travel medicine, and Dr. Annalise uh, Wilder-Smith, who is the chief editor of Journal of Travel Medicine. It's a very well-written article, and what they've done is they've summarized all the data for in-flight transmission. So um, if uh, I wanted to look at the first um, uh, uh, paragraph there. And uh, you can see here, uh, this is actually a flight from London to Hanoi. It's a British Airways flight. And here they noted 15 highly likely transmission of which 12 were in business class, two were in economy and one economy cabin flight attendant. Now here, 
uh, uh, the mask wearing was actually optional. The second one is actually another British Airway flights where again the masking was optional and they reported about two likely transmissions. Third one was an Emirates flight where actually masking was mandatory except during meal times. And uh, what they really found here was there were two likely transmissions. Now, compare, it to, um, compare the 15 likely transmissions to what they found in other places where the masking was completely mandatory and most people were masked at all times, including the staff uh, on a cruise ship or on a flight where they were wearing, actually they were wearing uh, respirators or FFP2 respirators. So if you can see here, hardly any transmission has been reported in these. And there was one likely transmission that was uh, reported here. So um, I think it's important to remember um, in when the surgical masks were actually worn both by the crew and the uh, uh, patients, uh, and here they did not serve meals on the flight, there was actually no transmission reported because as you can remember, airlines, they make, uh, um, they make sure that there are at least 12 air exchanges per hour. Um, this is again a COVID-19 outbreak associated with an air conditioning uh, in a restaurant and here again, uh, you will find that there were some reports of um, uh, um, COVID-19 transmission being reported because of a close and close space uh, with poor air conditioning. So as you can see, it is still controversial as to whether close and close spaces can actually lead to transmission. And it remains to be seen conclusively proven that that actually happens. But what happens in the hospital? And as you can imagine, uh, any intensive care setting or a critical care area generates a number of aerosol generating procedures. Now, a simple oxygen mask, even if you're just giving a mask, oxygen by mask, is actually an aerosol generating procedure. Uh, you're doing suction, you're doing ventilation, whether it's invasive or non-invasive, uh, nebulization, all of these are actually aerosol generating. So just like I mentioned earlier, um, in uh, here droplet nuclei is less than five micrometer. They can travel to more than one meter. Uh, droplets, uh, they uh, generally are higher. The size is much bigger than five micrometer and do not travel more than one meter because they're heavy, they're big, and they just drop directly down. So what exactly is the infectivity and has this actually been studied? So infectivity, there are, there are a number of case series reported not just from Wuhan, but for elsewhere as well, but the infectivity starts zero to three days before symptom onset. And what is noted is the infected person can shed viable virus uh, till eight uh, uh, to the ninth day uh, after um, exposure. So this is just some um, uh, studies that I'll be going through very quickly. These are the initial studies that actually came out. And here they've reported the nasal uh, viral loads in nasal swabs uh, and oropharyngeal swabs. And what they really found is when you talk about CT values, these are basically cycle threshold values in a PCR. So the lower the cycle threshold value, the higher is the chances of transmission or the higher the chance of infectivity. So what they really found in this, that the CT values were lower in severe cases versus those in mild to moderate cases. No brainer there. We expect that to happen. And this was actually conclusively proven, whether it was taken through uh, nasal swabs, uh, throat swabs, and the aggregated CT values are actually plotted out. And as you can see in the bottom panel, that is C, uh, that generally uh, these uh, CT values actually became really high. Uh, that is, they cross 30, beyond which we expect them not to be infective uh, very quickly, uh, by uh, definitely by the ninth day, they had actually turned the bed. So what is the data that is available at the moment? And this is one of the most comprehensive um, biological assessment of nine cases. And you can imagine just nine cases, they were able to do a full biological assessment that just tells you how difficult it is uh, to actually do this. And uh, so if you look at the um, uh, first panel here, they've actually taken different samples, swabs, sputum, stool, serum, and urine. And uh, here they've actually plotted uh, uh, the viral, uh, the um, patients with uh, 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 the viral load of all these people and at the x-axis is days after onset of symptoms. 
um, on the y-axis here on the uh, first panel of the panel A is actually the number of patients uh, with a sample. So they plotted swab, sputum, stool, urine, uh, and uh, serum. I want to bring your attention to the panel next to the panel A, which is panel D. And as you can see here, you look at the uh, thing below that, uh, it talks about uh, positive culture. And I wonder if you can see my arrow here. You can see here that the culture, they stop isolating the virus. Excuse me, sorry. They stop isolating the virus beyond eighth day. And uh, uh, so that's an important thing to actually remember, which means a viable virus could not be isolated uh, beyond day eight. Uh, of symptoms. What about panel B? And here what they did, as you can imagine, there were a lot of articles bringing out about how stool samples were still showing, uh, uh, were able to show the uh, virus by PCR. And as you can see here, they actually are plotting the viral load on panel B. If you pay attention to panel B, on the y-axis is actually the RNA copies. Uh, uh, and uh, on the x-axis here is actually the number of days after onset of symptoms. So as you can see, they were not able to actually isolate virus from the stool samples. Um, same thing if you look at panel F uh, and panel G, they actually combined panel F and panel G. And as you can see uh, on the y-axis here is proportion of patients uh, with um, uh, proportion of patients with uh, positive CT values. And as you can see that uh, beyond samples which contain less than six copies, six log copies never actually yielded an isolate. Same thing happened, the virus could not be cultured beyond day eight. So what did this whole thing really show? So pharyngeal shedding was highest during the first week of symptoms about up to about eight log copies is what they documented. Average viral load in any patient was about six log copies and it was maximum on day four. None of the stool, urine and blood isolated the virus despite RNA positivity. So there was RNA positivity or RNA shedding. It was detected, but it did not uh, automatically translate to the presence of a vir viable virus which could be isolated in culture. Like I said, virus could not be cultured beyond day eight and samples containing less than six log copies never actually yielded an isolate. 